Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Hope you guys all had a great weekend. Gosh, things are moving so fast, aren't they? Feels like to me, the world has changed and every day it's changing more. So it's important for us to get on here every day and reconnect. So I appreciate you guys always coming out and getting an update on everything going on. So over the weekend, it was a crazy weekend. I'll tell you about the storm after I tell you about what rabbit hole I got into. So I was digging into this rabbit hole over the weekend about free solo climbing. And I got onto this thing because this story popped up in my feed. And I was like, whoa. And it was about this dude right here who was able to scale El Capitan, which is a mountain in Yosemite. It's actually the mountain in Yosemite. It's world renowned for its glass like face and, <clears throat> you know, the challenge that it provides for climbers all around the world. Now, to this point, nobody had scaled this mountain without ropes from bottom to top, which is about 2,000 feet. It takes about two hours to do this. But this guy finally did it. Here's an image of him halfway up this rock. Just unbelievable. He's the first and only person to ever free solo, they call it, this, the face of El Capitan. Now, this was back in 2017, so I don't know why it came up in my feed now. But look at some of these images. Look at this image here. This, this is crazy. He's literally hanging off of the edge. No ropes. Just nuts. And down here, here's the route that he took from the valley, Yosemite Valley, all the way up to the top of El Capitan, 2,000 feet. So I started thinking, and I was like, what's inside the mind of a person who would try something like this. You know, people like this, they'll tell you that it's about challenging themselves and they tell you it's about personal development, right? But I'm not so sure. I sometimes think that people like to risk it all because it's more about recognition and how they're viewed by their peers, notoriety, or they wanna leave some kind of historical record behind of their legacy that can't be broken there's something inside of people that sometimes we feel like we have to do this because it helps us to feel important in this they did a, a brain scan on this guy and they saw that he had a zero fear response in fact his amygdala was completely inactive your amygdala is responsible for your fear response inside of the brain. And I was digging in a little bit more and I realized that the amygdala in autistic people is almost identical. It's completely inactive. And you think about, you know, these theories about what's been causing these recent explosion, this recent explosion of autism. And it's no wonder that thrill-seeking has taken off right alongside the increase in autism. I watched, I've been watching these videos, you know, people going out on parachutes and these, these paragliders. And now there's this new thing where they have like a wing. They almost look like a Batman or something. And literally they jump off of these huge faces and they just fly down the mountain just gliding along but also falling very fast and then at the very end they pull their chute and float safely to the ground but on the way as they're you know free falling and gliding at the same time with this body suit that looks like a wing they're getting very very close to you know lots of rocks and faces and you know different things like they're definitely on the edge of death like one false move or something cut through their wing or they made a miscalculation that would be the end of it so this has become very popular and i'm sure if they looked at the percentage of human beings who are thrill seekers i'm sure that the rate has shot through the roof now i don't have anything personal against this guy 
but his politics are definitely against the Most High. In fact, he describes himself as a militant anti-religion atheist and a feminist. Now, I'm against organized religion, but for much different reasons than this person probably is. I believe that our Christianity has become compromised by the enemy. And in order to have a complete and full relationship with the Most High and His Son, you should not be in these places because they're going to lead you down paths and down areas that will ultimately cause you know, you to go down the wide gate instead of the narrow gate. And you could lose your salvation. Now, why am we looking at this stuff? What does this have to do with everything? Well, I've got a curious mind, as you guys know, and I like to analyze this stuff because it's interesting to me because I think we can learn something from people like this and accomplishments like this. So I pulled up a bunch of videos, this guy on YouTube, and I was looking and watching him. He actually did a TED talk as well. And I was shocked because I noticed something about him. He was very robotic, no emotion. There were people laughing at things he said and he, that he didn't even think were funny. And on his TED Talk, he was sharing a particular moment that he had when he was climbing the face of Half Dome. Now, for those of you that have seen the face of Half Dome, I want to pull up a picture of it. This is Half Dome in Yosemite National Park. It's not far from El Capitan. But as you can see, the face of this thing is pretty much this large, very slippery granite face. Many parts of it actually are at an angle, an outward angle. In other words, you're climbing actually backwards to get up some of the parts of this face. Now, this picture doesn't even do it justice. But basically, he climbed the face of Half Dome and he did it with no ropes as well. Kind of as practice so he could climb El Capitan. Now, El Capitan is on the opposite side of Yosemite Valley, Valley. If any of you have been there before. It's been many, many years since I've been there. It got super touristy. Uh, people started booking out their trips years in advance. You couldn't even get a campground. And it just got weird. So I stopped going, I think, probably in my young adult years. I think I went once in my young adult years. And a few times in high school, I had a friend who uh, whose family would go to granite rocks and boulders and stuff. But he shared this moment, this guy, his name is Alex, uh, I can see what his last name is. Honold, Alex Honold, spelled like that is the name, the guy's name. He was actually born in Sacramento, same place I was born. And he started sharing this moment about what happened to him when he was on the face of Half Dome. He said that he was very close to the top. In fact, he could hear the tourists up there like talking and stuff because most people go up this backside of Half Dome. Okay, that's how they get there. It's a much safer route. It's basically like climbing stairs. I mean, of course, you've got the, uh, the wow factor and the danger aspect to it. But on a clear, dry day, it shouldn't be a problem for most people to accomplish. So he was very close to the top and he could hear the tourists at the top. And something strange happened. For the first time in his climbing career, he got to this step and he was not sure if his foot would hold it. Now, many of these steps, they're actually called smears. In other words, it's just barely an outcropping of rock that can you can almost not even see it with the naked eye. That's just enough to possibly hold your weight. He saw a smear and he knew that he couldn't go back and he knew he couldn't go forward. And it wasn't until that moment that he was, in fact, gripped by some level of fear. Now, most people would have just fallen off the rock. But what he decided to do is to take that next step, not knowing if it would hold. And he was able to complete it. He came up to this, uh, the top of the mountain. There were a bunch of tourists. And all they saw was a guy with no shirt on. And they thought to themselves, why is that guy so close to the edge? Didn't even realize he had just climbed the face of Half Dome. 
So in that moment, the fear did creep in, but it took that amount of fear to actually trigger his amygdala. So I was curious. I was like, how far? What's the farthest that someone has fallen and survived? So I was looking around and then I found this article. Now this is nuts. This lady fell 300 feet and was able to survive. You guys, that's like falling from the Statue of Liberty. Now, they say in this article that she was the only one to survive a fall of this height. And the way she survived was by landing on her feet, which is just crazy. But they say that if you hit your head first, that's pretty much immediate death. But if you fall on your feet, for some, somehow your body, you know, uh, absorbs the impact. You fold up and then you, there's a possibility that you could survive. Now, she was really messed up. There's actually some pictures here. If you're sensitive to pictures of people that have had trauma, you might want to look away and just listen at this point. But let's go down here into some of these pictures. These are all the fractures that she experienced. And amazingly, most of the fractures weren't even on her feet. Hip fracture. Uh, and then down here, they actually have uh, images of her. She broke her back in two places. And amazingly, even though she broke her back, she recovered full recovery and was able to walk here's the lady right here fell 300 feet unbelievable now <clears throat> she had a minor trauma to the head which probably saved her life her boyfriend watched the fall some there was some kind of error with the ropes these people were um climbing with ropes but uh they made a mistake human error look at all these pins she has in her body Whoa, pinned two places, pinned in the spine, hip pins, her femur broke on one side, and there's the surgery, probably don't want to see that, and I was just amazed, like God must have been with this woman on some level, now there are other stories of people falling in uh, planes that exploded midair, that survived much further distances. But those people were like strapped into chairs. Things like that. But basically this is how they say you should fall. You fall. First you hit your feet. And then you fall on your hips and your back. Now she did have a helmet on. Which probably saved her. Because if she didn't have a helmet. Her head probably would have just snapped and hit the ground. But this is how they're saying you should fall. If you ever fall from a building by accident or somebody pushes you from a second or third story building, there's a possibility you could survive that to tell your story. Now, that brings us to another story because this woman, they're saying that she committed suicide. And I don't believe that she probably did. I believe she was probably thrown out of the window. But basically... This is the Miss USA, former Miss USA, Chesley Christ. She was on Extra, and she's dead at 30 years old. And they're saying that somebody, or they're saying they're calling it a saucy side. But chances are, you know, that would be the perfect way to take somebody out if you were a bad actor, is to make it look like that and just toss them out the window. Very, very sad. But this is how these things happen. People get mixed up in these different lives. And let's say they think about speaking out against the agenda. All it takes is someone to roll in there and make it look like an accident. I know this is happening for a fact. I know it's happening. So crazy, crazy. It's weird too because I was just, I had this show already scheduled as you guys saw. Right? On Sunday, many of you had already thumbs it up, and it said, "A uh, woman f uh, survives 300 foot fall." Right there in the title. The very next day, this story comes up of a woman that actually fell from a building. Just weird times we're living in, isn't it? So, it was storming all week, and everybody's probably heard about the huge storm that happened. Blizzard came through. 
I'd never seen anything like it. I've been here three years and they said that there was actually, they hadn't seen anything like this in four years. So I must have missed that one. But um, it was definitely a blizzard. And the snow was literally blowing sideways. And in swirls. It was crazy. You could almost make out like little snow natos. And here's the weird thing about blowing snow. It doesn't distribute evenly on the ground. It's much different than... A light constant snow that blankets everything at the same pace. As soon as you start adding wind to the snow, it starts going in really weird places, like on window seals and underneath places, or it'll pile up on the side of the house. So my car was clear. There was nothing really around my car, maybe an inch or two, you know, easy peasy. What well, there was no snow on the top of my car, but the car started gathering up along the side of the building. Like two, two feet, three feet. And then I was like, I need to get on this. So about four or five shovel trips, about 30 minutes each to clear, to clear this snow. Now, for those of you that don't live in the Northeast or places that snow a lot, you pretty much have to stay on top of this snow. If you don't sit down on top of the snow, and shovel it consist consistently and early. It will literally get buried. And it will get so high. And then at that point it gets hard. And it will turn to ice. And then what you have is a block of ice. And you can't use that place. You can't use it as a parking space. You can't walk through it. Because it's very slippery. You will fall. Unless you have like cleated shoes or something. And so that's what I was dealing with over the weekend. Got through it and now it's stopped and the sun's actually out today. And I think later in the week it's supposed to be a little bit warmer. It should melt some of the snow. Thanks, Sanja, for the, the monthly uh, channel membership. We've got also, it brings up a good point now. I just put up a community post. We're switching kind of away from PayPal because they've got some account limitations going on over there and as you guys know there's these new irs rules which don't make any sense so we're kind of switching off of paypal to fundraiser so i put a link in all the descriptions now this is only for people that are able that have the means to do it this is by no means anything to pressure anybody i know we're all going through hard times right now but some of you have been blessed and want to share six dollars a month to help support the channel okay which is like the price of a cup of coffee and by all of us working together, we can get through anything that YouTube throws at us, right? We'll always have a voice because I can always make a channel. So uh, for those of you that were on the monthly PayPal membership, you got to pretty much cancel that and just click on the fundraiser link and go through there. Now, many of you are on here on the channel membership, and that's different. And that's where you saw that Sanja just signed up for. Now, that's great, and I love that, and you get a little badge for that and everything here in the chat, and I can see that you signed up when you comment in the comment section, but what happens is YouTube takes 30% of that, so just know that, and it's okay, because some people like to be, you know, they like to show that they showed their support here in the chat and stuff, like Sovalace here, he's got a badge next to his name, he's a channel member, but YouTube does take 30%, and so that that bothers some people. It bothers me, but I'm not going to tell you where you can give and where you can't give. But it's a lot better if you just go over to Fundraiser because Fundraiser doesn't take that much. So just a little update on on the giving aspect of the channel. I don't. I rarely talk about this stuff because it just makes me feel uncomfortable. But there's been enough people um, that have step forward and said you need to have some kind of way that some people can give to your channel like there are people that want to and they'll be upset if you don't provide that information so that's why i provide the information but rarely talk about it so let's move on to some of these other stories so i wanted to follow up on some of these headlines from last week now we were talking a lot about let me get to this page here we were talking a lot about electricity and how the controllers want to take us to a 100% electric society. Now, 
I know this is the future and it's not affecting us now in a big way, but it's coming. We all know it's coming because certain cities and states are starting to clamp down on these fossil fuels, aren't they? Well, this is the beginning of the gradualism that will bring us to 100% electric society. Now, I found this article here about how the electricity that would feed the electric society is generated. And I was floored. So, 60% of the way that electricity is generated is made right now with fossil fuels. 40% natural gas and about 20% coal. How in the world, with this current system of generating electricity, do they ex expect us to plug in another 276 million vehicles without increasing exponentially the fossil fuels that drive it? In other words, you're going to need a whole heck of a lot more coal and natural gas to create the electricity to power these vehicles. And I checked and there's about 276 million vehicles in the United States. I mean, has anybody even thought this out? It doesn't sound like it. It sounds like the real goal was to never really achieve full functionality of the electrical grid. Seems like the, f the real goal was electric tyranny and control in a world where there would be rolling climate lockdowns. Just like they did with the rolling spamdemic lockdowns. Now, we all know that the grid couldn't handle 100% electric fleet of 276 million cars. Not even close. Not to mention the strain that 40% of the gas stoves would put on the grid when switched to electric because they're talking about doing away with gas stoves. And about 40% of us have gas stoves. So there's another thing that would be put on the grid as well. We're talking about a massive expansion of the electric infrastructure that has never been seen before. Possibly even doubling or tripling the electric grid. And there are questions. Can the grid handle it? Is this even possible? How much of this grid will be using coal and natural gas to power it? which would go directly against what they're trying to do. What about the effects on the environment, having all this electricity out there? Remember what we discovered about mold growth and electromagnetic fields? Now, I did some more research and I found out that 20% of electric car owners turned them back in for gas once. A new study explains why nearly 20% of electric car owners return to gas. So, something wrong, right? Anyway, thanks for all the comments on this particular discussion about the electric kingdom, electric tyranny. We need to raise awareness about the absurd notion that everything could be replaced with electric. It just makes no sense at all. And basically, by mandating electricity... They aren't doing away with natural gas. They're increasing the use of natural gas, aren't they? Right? What they're doing is consolidating the control of it. That's what they're doing. They're consolidating the control of it into the generation of electricity so they can have the power instead of you being able to turn on your gas stove and you having the power. So essentially... It just becomes another mechanism of control and further erosion of our freedoms. You know, why do they get to use natural gas to produce electricity, but we can't use it to heat our homes and use our stoves? Now, everybody knows that when you use one energy source to make another energy source, you lose much of the efficiency of the energy through the process of conversion, don't you? In other words, there's waste here. It reminds me, you know, I always thought to myself, you know, we all go into these 
fish markets, right? We've all been into a fish market here or there. And we go in there and I look at these fish and I think about the waste. Because fish is one of those things where after it's been out there a while, a lot of people just don't want to eat the fish. It looks old to them. So they'll opt out. And I think to myself, how much fish is wasted through commerce? So in other words, somebody goes out into a boat. They either have a net or fishing poles. They catch a whole bunch of fish, right? All those, first of all, they've dusted off a bunch of the fish in the process, okay? Because they call it bycatch. In other words, they're catching the thing that they don't want to catch. And a lot of those fish end up dead. So there's some waste right there. Probably 5% bycatch. And just, just gone out of the ocean that they're not even keeping. Just killed the fish. Now the shark, of course, will get it. Then they bring all that fish to the fish market, right? Like a big fish market. Probably dump it off into, you know, these huge ice areas, iced areas, you know, ice trays and stuff like this. And then at that point, it goes from there to the different supermarkets and things. Well, as I said, that fish is sitting out there. A lot of it doesn't get bought. It's there for mostly display. So you're losing the efficiency of the product every time you add another step in the process. And it's no different with this. Using natural gas to make electricity, you've already affected the efficiency of the process. Now, all of those costs, of course, will get handed down to the consumer, and this will increase the electricity costs. So, ultimately, they are producing a far less efficient energy, aren't they? When they force electricity as the middleman to methane gas. And it's in, in that lack of efficiency is probably far worse for the environment than the leaky gas stoves that they're claiming are causing all these this methane to go up into the atmosphere. Now, before we move on from this, I want to recognize Brandon Hodgins. He left a great comment, and I want to read it to you. This was a couple hours ago. Brandon said, straight up control. Why don't all these quote-unquote leaders and spokesmen convert their personal planes, boats, and cars to this? And strictly use them until 2035 and then tell me the pros and cons. Not to mention what about planned obsolescence, like all the phones they sell. This is all hogwash. Forget not that it takes, uh, let's see, child, let's see, um, labor to, mine, I had to change the words there, to mine the cobalt and other ores to make the batteries, which are horrible for the environment. They can't refurbish them. As far as I know, look at the guy who had a Tesla, wanted to get a new battery, found out the cost, and blew his Tesla up with dynamite. Great comment, Brandon. So, let me check in with you guys, and we'll get into some of these other headlines today. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for showing up to the channel. Now, this information that I just shared with you is very important to know and to keep on your mind. Because people will come at you. Environmentalists will come at you. And, you know, there, there's all this misinformation out there about electric cars that is being pushed to make you let your guard down. So they're very, they're, they're very much putting out a lot of propaganda about electric cars because it's about money, isn't it? Because the electric car industry makes a lot of money for places like California. So, of course, they're going to tell you the bright side to it, but they're never going to tell you the dark side to it. So it's important to be armed with this information so that you can share this when someone comes at you or they want to debate you. And I'll provide links to all this stuff in the pinned comment so you can show them links to it and, and ask them. You can ask them pointed questions like, how do you think electricity is made? And you can quote the statistic of 60% comes from fossil fuels and ask them how they're going to deal with that. And then you get people thinking. So... Let's get into these, some, some of these other headlines today. Now, this is kind of funny. Thump is at it again. He doesn't stop. Now, some people ask me, why do you keep covering Thump? Well, the real question you should be asking yourself is, why does the mainstream media keep covering him? Remember, they cancel cultured him and 
There wasn't supposed to be anything else said about him. He was supposed to basically crawl into a hole and lose all his riches, lost all his sponsorships. No one wanted to go to his golf courses anymore in Mar-a-Lago. And that's what everyone said was going to happen in the media. And yet here he is still standing and still being covered daily. So that's the question you should be asking yourself, because if it was, if the right left paradigm was real, the left would simply stop talking about him by giving him the attention that he wants. They're keeping him relevant. And that exposes the right left paradigm because they need him to play the other side. They need him to be the other side of the chessboard. And I believe that he will play a huge part in the future plan of the controllers. Here he says that Congress should rehire service members who got ditched for refusing the sticker. These are his latest comments. And all I can think of when I think of him saying these things is, can't get fooled again. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Or can't get fooled again, or whatever it is. The famous quote by the Bushwhacker. Now, what service member in their right mind would return in the military after how they were treated and threatened and told that they were going to lose all their benefits and everything because they didn't get the sticker. I can't imagine one. I can't imagine one. Now, he's also got some other comments here. He's also saying that he wants to pardon the crapper hole people if he was reelected. So... Where was all this sentiment back after when all these people were getting arrested? Didn't say a peep, didn't say a word. Now all of a sudden he's standing up for them. That's because he wants to get reelected. And there are still people that are dumb enough to vote for him. Or any politician. Bo Jivin or Thump. They're all corrupted. Now, got a next story here. Now, some people, some very unfortunate people in Ohio tried to get out of the cold, right? Because that's what everyone's trying to do. It's crazy up here. It's like a ghost town. You know, the storm was coming and everyone like ran for the hills. There's hardly any cars on the street. I don't know where these people go. Maybe they go down to Florida. I don't know. But these poor people in Ohio tried to get out of the cold by booking a mini vacation at the Hampton Inn. Well... It was almost their last vacation. They were at the pool and they were exposed to carbon monoxide. Seven people in critical condition. Let's read this. Seven people were hospitalized in critical condition Saturday after suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning at the Hampton Inn in Ohio. Now, if any of you live in uh, live in Ohio, let's see, where was it? Marysville. Some of you have probably heard this story. A total of nine people were taken to hospitals. Marysville Fire Chief Jay Riley told the newspaper that the source of the carbon monoxide was unclear, but everyone who was hospitalized had been in the hotel's pool area. So this, I think this was Marysville, Ohio. Riley said the victims included children and adults. He did not provide exact ages. They received 911 calls about a two-year-old girl who had either fallen into the pool or was found in the pool unconscious at the Hampton Inn in Marysville. Then all of a sudden, all these other 911 calls followed. People were experiencing dizziness, burning in the throat. Wow, that sounds like something different. You know, these these places, these cooped up places, you know. Um, I mean, this could have been a, a mold spore outbreak or something. I've been talking a lot about that lately, haven't we? But basically, seven patients are in critical condition. Unbelievable. Just this is very close to Columbus. So if you live in Columbus, Ohio, you've probably heard this story. Wow. Well, T-Mobile is in denial about people's right to their own bodily autonomy. As they go on a firing rampage against the unstickered. Wow. So if you want to make a statement against T-Mobile um, and you're on the fence of switching to another carrier, let's say Verizon or something, and you call T-Mobile to cancel, uh, maybe you want to mention this to them. Maybe this should be the reason why you switch. Now, I know nowadays a lot of these networks, 
Uh, basically, people sign up for them because of how well of a reception they get in certain areas. So, you know, I'm not telling you to ditch T-Mobile, but if you're on the fence and you've been thinking about it, maybe now's the time. It says T-Mobile will fire corporate employees who aren't fully Pokemon stickered against the sticker. The carrier confirmed the deadline after the outlet obtained an internal email in which Deanne King, T-Mobile's chief human resources officer, said the company will put employees who have gone out, gone out and only gotten one dose on unpaid leave. So basically, they're going even against the people that are not fully dosed. We told you this was going to happen. They're not going to leave you alone until you do exactly what they say. And then at that point, you realize that you're on somebody else's agenda. One day you wake up and you say, wow, that wasn't enough and they want more. And they're still treating me like this. I think that's when most people are going to wake up. So that's what's going on with T-Mobile. Now, what other stories do we have here? As we start to wind down the show, of course, we've got to talk about the Canadian truckers and the convoy. Brave men and women out there in Canada trying to get it done over the weekend. Thousands showed up to the protests. And here are some of the pictures from the event. Let's fix that up for you guys. Here's some of the pictures as they went to, where did they go to? They went to Ottawa. Now, this wasn't just them showing up at Ottawa. This is an entire convoy going across the country. Uh, they, were, they had support at almost every overpass. People were honking their horns. And by the end of it, there were a thousand of them. Now, there are rumors that Trudeau basically tucktailed and ran off and was in hiding. Okay. Now, I don't doubt that that's the case, but none of these people were talking about any violence. Some of them did talk about, you know, protesting in front of people's houses, which is completely legal. But they learned their lesson from the crapper hole event. They learned their lesson, and that's good to hear. Okay. Because that whole thing was a setup. It was a honey trap. So they did it right. And I guess we're going to see how all of this shakes out. But of course, Trudeau is saying that these this is just a small fringe group. You know, but what did you expect him to say, right? Now, what's on with this next story? This next story is the kind of stuff we talked about that would happen, didn't we? When you lock everyone in your homes... There are unintended consequences. We talked about how young people were disproportionately affected. And they started the taking of their own lives. And that that spiked during the lockdowns and beyond. And now, here we have another unintended consequence. That rivals the quote-unquote Vidco deaths. Deaths of people whose medical care was disrupted quadrupled. In the first Vidco lockdown. Now. Many of you had shared with me that. The. You know. Times that you had to go to the doctor. To maintain your health. You know. Regular health maintenance. Some of you have conditions. Some of you have diabetes. And things like that. And you have to continue to go to the doctor. Some of you are on medications that. You have to get filled every single month. And this was interrupted during the spam demic. And. You know, hospital staff was reduced or redirected to solely focus on Vidco. And the, the quote-unquote non-essential doctor's appointments were delayed or done away with. You know, now this even, even diagnosis fits into this, you know. The beginnings of being sick, okay. So some people are just figuring out that they have diabetes. Maybe they weren't seen the way they should have been seen because that was non-essential, considered non-essential. So there was a lot of fallout from this. There was a lot of people that got very sick because they did not get the proper treatment. And their care was interrupted. And now we're seeing the actual statistics that they died four times the rate. Let's read this story. This is important. Deaths of patients who had their medical care disrupted quadrupled during the first lockdown. A study has found prompting warnings about the health impact of the restrictions. 
Data from seven mortuaries covering nine areas of the country found a significant increase in the number of people who had died from a potentially treatable condition. In one case study, the patient with asthma who was experiencing vidco symptoms and chest pain was told to self-isolate and died several days later from a heart attack. In another, a relative noticed that a loved one had deteriorated the period of a few days, and their GP arranged for a community matron to assess them the following day. When the matron arrived, they found the patient dead. So this goes on and on and on, and now they're finally starting to admit what they did was a huge mistake. You can't just stop society like that when there's only a small segment of this society that is at risk, at serious risk of something happening. You focus on the part of the society that is at risk of something happening, and that's where you limit your scope as to how you're going to handle the situation. Now, I remember in the beginning, they weren't even admitting that there were certain people that were most at risk. They, or at least they didn't admit it by age. They said if you have any comorbid conditions, but they didn't actually uh, you know, isolate the certain age group. It wasn't until after the numbers started piling up that they tried so hard to skew, right? It wasn't until after those numbers started piling up that we really saw that people under 21, for instance, had a far less likely chance of ever even getting hospitalized from this. And then as the, the age groups got older, then it became more serious. But even in the middle age group, up to the 40s, the numbers were relatively small, like half maybe or less even. So here's a funny story. Give it You got to give it to Connecticut. This guy burned his house down because he was trying to use a flamethrower to melt snow outside. Now I can sympathize with this guy. You know, you go out three or four times, you shovel the snow, and it just comes right back. Well, this guy just decided he was going to use a flamethrower. <laughs> this is unbelievable. I wonder if he was like a vet or something. Connecticut homeowner accidentally set their house ablaze while trying to thaw their property with a flamethrower. According to the fire officials in the town of Seymour. Now, this isn't far from me. This is literally a couple towns over from where I'm at. And... Firefighters responded to the scene of the house fire, 5.30 p.m. on Saturday. Wow, I bet you the, uh, I mean, this is crazy. Now, understand, like, if you've never lived in the Northeast or you don't know what this is about, this ice is a serious big deal, okay? You could have a foot thick of solid ice going down your driveway if you're not on top of this stuff. And it literally, it will not melt until, like, you know, March or April, literally. And there, there are a lot of, you know, driveways and hills and steep grades in this area of Connecticut. And so what happens is it, you could go down the wrong hill and it, it would be like a death trap. I remember the first year I was here, you know, I have a, a Nissan Xterra late model. I love my truck. It's a 2002 and it has four wheel drive. And I was going up this hill and it would look like a steep hill, but I'm like, I'm in a truck, right? wrong go i get about three quarters of the way up this hill and i hit some black ice and my truck starts sliding backwards down a like probably a 35 percent grade maybe i don't know maybe maybe that's an exaggeration but it was a very steep hill and at the bottom of the hill there was a sign that says no trucks no utility trucks anyways no heavy trucks it didn't say no trucks no cars because it was a street right so I start sliding backwards and I go back and I'm starting to pick up speed and I'm like, what do I do now? So I turn the wheel. Luckily, I wasn't going too fast to actually jump the curb and the car just slowly rested into the curb about halfway down the hill. But the danger is if you slide all the way down, you will go right out into the middle of traffic and nobody will see you and you'll get T-boned and probably die. So... I, the truck rested into the curb and I said, what do I do now? So I engaged the four wheel drive and I was able to very slowly creep off of the, this grade and onto the flat surface above, but it was a harrowing moment. I was like, wow, I guess this is serious business. And now you know why there's so many accidents up in the Northeast. It's a far crazier place. 
to be and live because of the weather. Now, this weather is not all the time. This is only a second or third snowstorm or snow we've had. The other snow has been just, you know, a couple inches, five inches, eight inches with no flurries or blowing snow. But um, it's a serious thing out here. So this guy decided he had had enough and he pulled out his flamethrower to melt the ice and snow. An exterior wall was in flames when firefighters arrived, but it was quickly extinguished and the home was saved according to the post. We do not recommend the use of a flamethrower or any similar devices as an attempt to melt ice. The post said, Seymour is about eight hours, eight miles north of New Haven. While flamethrowers can be dangerous, they are sometimes used by farmers and ranchers for land management and by firefighters performing controlled burns. They are legal to own, though some states, such as California, of course California, have barriers to ownership. So, I thought you guys would get a kick out of that story. Now, here's probably our last story for today. We'll probably be back on tomorrow with more headlines. I'm looking into some things to decode, um, but... I, I, I never like to just dig around for things. I like to kind of let the natural process happen, which is you guys suggesting different things for me to decode or the Holy Spirit impressing upon me to decode certain things. But I was watching a little bit of the game last night with football. And <laughs> this is crazy. If you knew you guys watched the Bengals Chiefs game, it says here that after rallying from down 18 points to force overtime, that's a 6-6-6 right there, Cincinnati beat the two-time defending AFC champions on Evan McPherson's 33-yard field goal. The Bengals now head to their first Super Bowl in 33 years and will face the winner of the NFC champions. You can't make this stuff up, you guys. You can't make it up. Now, I don't know how this happens, but I believe that this is just a manifestation of the dark matrix that we live in. Things manifesting spiritually, seemingly by accident, but really it's the part of the construct of how the world works. Let's go into the chat here for a little bit. I know I was all over the place today, but um, there was a lot of stuff I wanted to cover with you guys. What do you guys think about the flamethrower, man? Maybe I should call him up and have him come over and do my place. Just tell him to, you know, stay back from the house. You know, we don't need you to get all the ice out all the way up to the house. You can stop short by about five feet, maybe. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's a year of the tiger, says Wacky Wack. Thanks for reminding us about that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Someone said something about Ottawa. It's important. There were one to two million on feet in Ottawa from source. Wow. And they really tried to downplay that. They, they said that it was only a few thousand. Wow. Yes. Seymour is close to Handy Sook. I actually have a video. I don't know if I took it down, but I drove right into the school. And then afterwards, I was like, man, that probably wasn't a good idea, you know, with the, given the history of this place. But, you know, I was just... I was just cruising around. I was in my truck and I wanted to see it. I got it all on video and I drove through. Why did I drive through? Because when they redesigned the school, it looks like a crown serpent from the air. If you, anyone could go into Google Earth and pull up Handy Sook, and I'm saying it that way on purpose. This is a very sensitive topic. And if you look from the air, you will see a, a crown and a serpent underneath it. It's clear as day. So then we went on the rabbit hole trail of figuring out what the crown serpent was. And there's a very dark history to it. It goes all the way back to Quetzalcoatl. So um, I drove through and did like a little tour of it. And I put it up, I think on this channel or the other channel. I can't remember. Strange times, you guys. Strange times. Flamethrower dude. Yeah. All right. I'm just reading through your comments here. A 
They miss him as lying about everything, pretty much. Year of the Cat, as well? Yes, Rolando, it's the Serpent God is the Crown Serpent. And we saw the Serpent crowned in the movie I Am Legend when he pulls his Cobra Mustang up under the crown as he's chasing the deer in the very beginning of the film. So these people know what's going on. This is who they worship. The Serpent is crowned. So... And there's so much more to the crown serpent. We have a documentary on the crown serpent. If you're curious and you, there's something else you want to watch after this show, go onto the channel and look up, uh, just type in documentary, Into the Stars documentary, and it'll pull up all our documentaries. And from there, you can find the documentary we did on the crown serpent. Yeah, a lot of these mainstream outlets are not covering the convoy. And listen, there's really no incentive for them to cover it. They don't like it when people speak out, especially when they speak out peacefully. Now, what I liked that I saw with this particular protest is the protesters were holding each other accountable. In other words, when they saw somebody trying to be a provocateur, they would actually call them out. And I wouldn't even be bothered if they, you know, notified a police officer about it. Say, hey, this guy's talking about doing this and that. Because that's that's working directly against the movement. All it takes is one or two people to start some mess, just like what happened with the crapper hole, to derail all of the hard work and energy and time that everybody put in to trying to make change. So, if you're ever in one of these situations where you're protesting and you, you see someone that's just acting shady, trying to incite the crowd to do certain things, let them know this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. All right. Oh, thanks, Lola. Lola saw the video of the drive through that we did over there. Thanks for that. Okay. Canadian truckers seem to be very prepared for these, for this. Thanks, nuts, D's. I'm going to say your name backwards because you get in trouble. Object in space, it speeds up and then slows down. I have not heard of that, Susan. No. Okay. Now, these heads of state and these controllers, they know that they're messing up. They know that they don't have the public sentiment necessary. This is why they hide. This is why you don't see these people in public anymore. But they're, gonna, they're trying to push it through anyway. And then they got the mainstream media with them helping to convince everybody that we're just a tiny minority when in fact they forget about the 50% of America that they even coerced with threats and giveaways to do it in the first place. That's not somebody who supports it. They had to do it or they felt compelled to do it because they thought they were going to get something in return or because they were forced to under threat of losing their job. So of course there isn't a popularity about this. Okay. That's why they had to do all that to get everybody to do it. So, we all know, like Joan Rivers said, we all know what the truth is. All right, you guys. We'll be back on here tomorrow with probably some headlines or who knows. Maybe I'll decode something today, do a montage and have that up for tomorrow. I am looking at this series called Chosen. Let's see if I have it here. It's a Netflix series about a meteor that comes from outer space. I don't think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to look at it, but it's a series, so it could take a while. But uh, this is everything we've been talking about. And apparently, this meteor uh, causes a mold outbreak. So, we will take a look at that. It's a town of Middlebow. All right. All right, you guys have a great rest of your day. Stay warm. And... Lots of prayers, you guys. This is a very crazy time. A lot of us are going through a lot right now. There are still millions of us who are, you know, waiting to hear back from our employers to see if we're going to be fired. We, you know, and our hearts and prayers should be with those people because they have been put in a very tough position. Position that not everyone's in, but there are probably millions that are. And they have to make a very hard decision about what they're going to do with their own personal autonomy. 
And so prayers for them and prayers for the people that are just afraid because this is a scary time for a lot of people. But understand that these things have to happen for the end to come. So try to flip the script on that and think of it as being rejoicing because now we know that the end is close. The worse it gets, the closer we are, right? And also be grateful for the things you do have. A warm place to sleep. A lot of people don't have that. You have food in your stomach. And even though things are going wrong in your life, then, you know, you still have the things that God promised you. Shelter and food. I love each and every one of you. Have a great rest of your day, you guys. Take care and be safe.